Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have Dr. Adina with us. Dr. Adina is a specialist who focuses on addiction, and she has a lot of great input. She has a great story to tell and some great advice to share. Now, before we begin, I just want to say that Dr. Adina is uh, any medical advice that she shares. Remember that she is not a um, medical doctor and that you always should check with your own primary doctor or your your uh, specialist to make sure that any um, any of the advice she gives is okay for you to utilize. People with conditions or take other medications might have interactions. So it's always good to converse with your medical doctor first to make sure that you are able to um, do any of the advice that is um, explicit in this video. All righty, so Dr. Dina, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Hi guys, so my name is Dr. Adina and I am a pharmacist. So my specialty is in medications. And I uh, just want to say that whatever, just like Stacy said, whatever it is that I share today on this video is for informational purposes only. It is what has been my personal um, experience with my loved one, who I'm going to refer to as Jack, and it should not be taken as medical advice. It is to be used solely for informational purposes, and each of you should seek your own medical advice from your own healthcare professionals, your own physicians um, are the ones that need to tell you your medical advice, please. So I have been a pharmacist for over uh, 20 years now. And what happened with me is that I was a pharmacist during the opioid crisis starting. So when back then in 2001, when the opioid crisis was starting slowly, that is when I practiced pharmacy in various uh, major retail store corporations. And so I ended up seeing the opioid crisis unfold, both in the pharmacy setting and also in my own loved one, Jack. This was very um, disheartening to watch. And at the time, I wasn't fully aware of what was taking place because there was a lot of lies going on in the industry that have now been revealed in the last approximately seven or so years. Uh, what we were being told as pharmacists and physicians was that when you prescribe an opioid or when you dispense an opioid, know that it is only less than 1% addictive. And the motto that they had taught us was that make sure that you give as much as you can in order for you to be able to control the patient's pain. And this was being done by major big pharma industries on a wide scale and specific ones that started it. And it started to just go out towards the rest of the industries as well, the rest of the pharmaceutical companies as well. And, uh, that is what we practiced with. That is what they had told us. And pharmacists, we are the kind of professionals that we will not just believe big pharma if they tell us, oh, this is how it is. We make sure we go in ourselves and read the studies and listen to what the physician's opinions are also about the uh, drugs that they are putting out there. But in this case, what had occurred is that the big company that had uh, actually make, made the drugs that were addictive and had put them out there for us to give and had made an advertisement saying it's less than 1% addictive, also went to big major physician organizations and got them on board as well by presenting false documents to the FDA. And so then when pharmacists see that, okay, physicians are also trusting this and um, we trust physicians pharmacists trust physicians a lot. And when we started seeing that, okay, these pain management organizations are accepting this and this is what they're doing. A lot of pharmacists just went along with uh, this mentality. And about seven years ago, they found out that the opioids, because they started noticing how bad the opioid crisis had become, uh, there was a team of people who started to investigate deeply 
And they found out all of those things that I just said to you. And uh, there is a series that if you want to know, if you want to see how it played out, it is pretty accurate. It's called Dope Sick that you guys can go and watch. Um, and on that series, it kind of goes and tells the story of what happened and how it all came out. But they found out basically that opioids are extremely addictive and about one in four people can get addicted to opioids. And throughout this entire time that I watched the opioid crisis unfold and I watched it unfold in Jack, um, there was a certain mentality that myself and uh, his entire family had uh, been taught. The mentality was that in order for Jack, I am referring to him as Jack, this is a blood relative of mine, and I love him very deeply. They were telling us that Jack needs to hit rock bottom in order for him to get well. These are the, the people that would say this to us were psychologists, were treatment facilities. And honestly, even right now, that is still the mainstream mentality in the United States. Mm -hmm. If you let the person hit rock bottom. But I want to let you guys know that there is a different way that Jack and I ended up dealing with this situation. And the time when it became a turning point for us was when I heard my psychologist actually say to me that, well, do you want him, do you want to just let him die? Why don't you just let him die? And when she said that, um, it really hit me very deep down in my heart. And I went home and I really had to think about that. And I love Jack so dearly. And it was very hard for me to believe that that is a mentality that she would want me to follow and to just let him die. And all of a sudden I had this epiphany that, wait a minute, all of this time they've been telling us, let him hit rock bottom, let him hit rock bottom, let him hit rock bottom. Where is that leading to? Right. And it suddenly, I came to the realization as a pharmacist that based on the current drugs that are currently out there, hit rock bottom can literally mean death. Yeah. And so what they are saying is let him hit rock bottom, let him hit rock bottom. And then the idea of death was even introduced. Mm -hmm. And they even said, why don't you let him die? Because isn't he suffering? And isn't everyone else around him suffering? Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of idea that was placed into our family's mind. And also the lie was placed in our mind that if you do not let him hit rock bottom, and if you do continue to help this person, they will not get well. Mm -hmm. And that is where that lie comes in, where, where they say that if you do not, like not help him at all, don't help him at all, right. and let him hit rock bottom, He's going to continue this. And that is just a um, lie that can unfortunately cause people to die right now with the current drugs. Right. I understand also where this mentality stems from. It stems from the mentality of codependency where they the psychologists and treatment facilities that have come up with this mentality that originated in the Alcoholics Anonymous also felt that fam this is such a difficult disease state to deal with. Right yeah. now it is deemed a disease state called opioid use disorder that it is so difficult to deal with that family members end up going down with that individual. And for that reason, they came up with this mentality that let them hit rock bottom, let them hit rock bottom, take care of yourself, mm -hmm. focus on yourself, right? Which there is some truth to that, that there is some truth to that. But I ended up finding new psychologists that said that, yes, 
you should take care of yourself. However, you can still do those things which you feel you can do Mm -hmm. for your loved one that make you joyful. Right. Bring you peace Mm -hmm. that make you happy. That doesn't mean that in my case, I was able to help Jack tremendously. And I found that out over the last four years that I've been with him. Now we have an amazing relationship. But what I was being told is that although in my heart, I wanted to help him, yeah. I was being told that that is wrong. Right. That that means that that is um, harmful to you and you need to stop thinking that way and you have a problem and you have a a lot of parents and people are being told that you are codependent. Mm -hmm. Codependency is not a uh, medical condition, by the way, it is not in the DSM criteria, right? It is not a psychological condition even that has been put in there, but this is what they would say. And these are professionals saying this to you. And so I found myself in a place with Jack where I had this um, moment of, uh, I had a moment where I felt the love of Jesus Christ in my life. And in that moment, there was an instantaneous change in me. And I started to see Jack in a completely different light. Yeah. Yeah. All I started to care about was love. Mm -hmm. And all I started to care about was God's love toward all of his people, his creation, all of his creation. And when I started seeing Jack from that perspective, my entire understanding changed on how to deal with him. And it was very difficult for me, even as a pharmacist, I want, I want the whole people to understand that. Imagine you're a medical professional, yeah. you're in this profession. I had to fight tooth and nail with treatment facilities, with other psychologists who were telling me to let him go and let him hit rock bottom. Right. And it was so hard for me because I had no, no one was helping me. Yeah. No, And people, even loved ones were telling me, why are you helping him? Why? He's not listening to you. Why are you helping him? Right. But there was only one thing that told me otherwise. It is that still small voice in my mind that was coming from love. Yeah. Place of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was the only voice that was telling me differently. Right. That voice was telling me to go after him, to get him back. And so that is the only voice that I started to listen to. Right. Listening to him had me, um, realize a lot of things and it actually helped me find Jack on three occasions when he was completely lost on the streets Mm -hmm. because Jack was also formerly incarcerated. He had a multiple felony record Mm -hmm. and he was on uh, injectable crystal meth and heroin. And when he would leave jail, he will come out and he would live on the streets. And when him and I started this journey together with God, he uh, was in a place where he did not care if he went to jail. Right. He did not care if he committed crime. All he cared about was getting his drugs. Mm -hmm. And so as a pharmacist, I just want to share with you that the drugs And the cravings that people get when they are on them are extremely powerful. Oh, yeah. The if if you're thinking, oh, my loved one is choosing the drugs over me or oh, I just want to say, please stop taking it personally and understand that there is a huge, tremendous amount 
of craving that they are feeling. And if they do not get their next dose of opiates, Mm -hmm. they will start withdrawing with excruciating withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. And so what I'm, I want people to understand, I am not saying for them to not seek medical attention or not get medical care. There are good treatment facilities that they can go to. Yeah. They can get help with as time is going on. It's becoming more and more like that. In fact, right now they can even seek help from their own primary care physicians as uh, pharmacy is growing and the medical community is understanding this better. There have been new modalities placed where physicians have to actually be educated about substance use disorder and now know how to treat someone or at the very least refer you to a physician that knows how to treat you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want people to understand they should still seek treatment. Yes. However, throughout this journey, what happened with Jack and I is that we were able to find a very loving, joyful, fun relationship, regardless mm-hmm. of where he was in his life. Right. Because when people are have substance use disorder in general, there can be times where they are in recovery. And unfortunately, there can be times when they are in relapse. Right. And the way this worked, the way God works Mm -hmm. was that he just wanted me to be his loved one and love him, love him the way that God loves him. And so what happened is that when Jack, for the first time he came out of jail, he came to my home and um, all of a sudden he took off because that can happen. And I even had an extensive conversation with him about this. And he told me, I just, I don't understand what happens. Like he'll start getting thoughts in his mind about he needs to go. And, and then all of a sudden he'll start getting thoughts in his mind about how I am not trying to help him and how I, you know, he should leave. And, and, and then he leaves. And yeah. when a person leaves like that, they don't want to be found. So no. when he would leave, nobody could find him. So On these three occasions that I found him, the first time what happened is I was sitting on the couch and I was watching television. And all of a sudden, remember, I was telling you about the still small voice in your mind. Yeah. I start to hear go there. And at first it was just once or twice. But then what started to happen is that it got more and more go there, go there, go there, go. And and then I was like compelled to get up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And the movie that I was watching that I used to be very into started to tune out and Mm -hmm. I could no longer see what was going on or understand. All I could hear in my mind was this go there voice. Right. So I got up and I said, I've got to go there. And my husband was like, go with her. (laughs) He said, I said, I'm quite sure, but I have a feeling I'm supposed to go to find Jack. And I left the house and I found Jack that first time uh, within about, I want to say 15 minutes, I found him. Wow. The drive to the uh, city that I was pointed to Mm -hmm. was um, approximately 10 minutes. So then after that, there was another, um, hang on, sorry, I got lost there. Then after that, there was another five minutes of searching and it became approximately 15 minutes where I found him. And I tell you, he was on his bicycle and his face became white when he saw me. Wow. And he said, how in the world did you find me? <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, I said, I found you with Jesus. And I said that because although I've been Christian my entire life, right? I never yeah. understood God's love and the way he loves all of his creation or and everything that throughout that moment, I told you that moment where I had with Jesus, I found out what yeah. you love everybody like. What? And then I started reading the Bible very, uh, a lot, like every day I was reading. So I knew that that's what I was 
hearing the still small voice in my mind was yeah. coming from him because then later on he started to identify that this is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And so when I found him that first time, that's what I said to him. I said, I found you with Jesus. And he said, well, I'm not coming home. And this is what I want you guys to know that the biblical definition of love. Okay. Love is patient. Mm -hmm. Love is kind. Yes. And Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. This, mm -hmm. I see some verses. I'm going to another area of that same passage. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and yeah. always perseveres. And in this instance, it has to do love is patient, love is kind. Okay. Yeah. So when he said, I am not coming home, I did not go into a fitting rage. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I may have in the past. Yeah, right? yeah. And be like, I can't believe it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. All of this stuff and go into a place of fear, which is the opposite of love. Right. I came from a place of love and I said, Well, let me buy you some dinner then. Mm -hmm. And we went and I bought him dinner. I got to know some of his friends. And when I met his friends, I saw that they were. They all had kind of like the similar kind of stories. Yeah. You know, they had been having some sort of childhood trauma or trauma from war or some sort of trauma in their life that had ended up leading them to this place where they ended up misusing substances yeah. and you're addicted. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to go home after dinner. I said, I'm going to go home and you just let me know when I should come back and get you. Okay. So. I go home mm -hmm. and an entire night passes by and at night in my mind, I felt God spoke that, um, I am taking care of him sleep. And so I was able to sleep before I could not sleep. Right. That's the difference with God. So I fell asleep and the next morning I got up, I didn't feel him say go there or anything. I just stayed like that at night. Again, when I went to sleep, I felt him say, you need to go and get him tomorrow because he will not have his bicycle anymore. And I said, okay. And I'm, <laughs> as I'm hearing this still small voice in my mind, I'm wondering, is that me talking right. to myself? You know, I'm wondering all these things. And so at the time, I didn't know about the fact that millions of people hear the voice of Jesus Christ. I only found that out after, after I started to actually tune into this and tune into the voice and see all the good things that he was doing in our lives. And then I was wondering, is this only happening to me? And then I went and I looked into the churches and I find out, wait a minute, what? There's an entire ministry of how to find people with Jesus. Right. And I was like, I didn't even know that, you know? Yeah, because we're busy with our lives. So we're not really tuning in to listen to the voice of God. Right, right. And so, so then the second time, again, I was sitting at, at watching TV the next night, and I had forgotten about that too. And after my busy day, sit there again, I'm hearing go there, go there, go there. And I start going again within minutes, I find him. What is the first thing you think he said to me when I found him? The what? first thing he said, oh, I'm so glad that you're here because I cannot have my bicycle anymore. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, Wait, what? So then I, he's like, can we return my bicycle? Cause I can't keep it anymore. And I want to go home. And I said, okay. And we went, we returned the bicycle and we came home together. And then the third time he was lost in the middle of like Hollywood. And again, I was sitting and um, I was watching television. And this time the difference was that because I had been tuning into that voice and I had been doing biblical meditation and listening, yeah. I could mm -hmm. start hearing that more and more, you know? Yeah. So this time I felt he spoke more. And 
this time he gave me an exact location and a time. And he said, you got to go pick him up Saturday night, 9 p.m. from this location. And the next night, this was like in Hollywood. And it was during the pandemic when it was a very dangerous times. Like we were right. hearing news shootings, this, that. And I'm like, yeah, I you, what? <laughs> so I'm calling my uh, relatives. I'm like, I'm afraid. Like, again, the fear is kicking in. Right. Yeah. But love mm -hmm. overcomes fear. Right. Drives out all fear. So I'm like uh, wondering, okay, do I go? Don't I go? And I'm discussing this around 8.30 p.m. Yeah. I, like a bird flies to its nest. I put the phone down and I'm like, I've got to go get him. Right. I drive to the location and I'm telling you 9.00. I turn down my window. There is a few people standing there. I say, I am here for, and I say his name. Well, I'm going to call him Jack yeah. here. Mm -hmm. and they say who wants to know and this was like a place where there was a bunch of tents and I told him my relationship and they call him out by his street name because people when they're living on the streets have street names yeah and out he comes from the tent and I was like like I couldn't believe it that's crazy and, yeah and that voice had told me when you go to him tell him that God said he wants to go fishing with you tomorrow. And he, when he saw me, he was very upset. And he said, I can't believe sh you've shown up here. Um, I can't even talk to you. And I said, well, the only reason I came is because God told me to come and take you fishing. And he said, well, the only reason I'm one, I want you to know the only reason that I'm listening to you is because God told you to come and take me fishing with you. And I was like, Okay. So then we started having a rapport. He had a very bad wound on his knee. He could put his finger through it. Wow. Yes. He had a huge uh, abscess that had ruptured. And I didn't know at the time, but he was COVID positive. Wow. And so <laughs> I ended up uh, being able to slowly, very slowly. And again, here is where it says love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not self-seeking. Right. Mm -hmm. So he didn't want to come home. I told him, that's fine. I will put you in a hotel. Right. When he didn't want to come home, I would just put him in a hotel. Mm -hmm. What did that do for me? Some of some people out there may wonder, OK, maybe you could afford that. Yes, that's true. I can afford it. Yeah. But even those of you who cannot afford it. Right. The main thing that mattered to Jack that he told me afterwards was that lunch that I would have with him and his friends or a cup of coffee, a simple cup of coffee that I would have with, with his friends. And I would not judge him in any way whatsoever, but right. I would have a normal conversation with them without any kind of judgment. And I would really hear them out that is what mattered most to Jack. Right. But in those moments where I did the lunch or I put him in hotels, what that did for me was I was able to get a restful night of sleep. Yeah. I had joy in my life. Right. And guess who else did? His mom. His mom knew where he was. His mom knew, okay, he's in this location. Or, okay, he's alive. Right. Before, the way that we were doing it the world's way was, I have no clue where he is. We would start calling hospital after hospital. Right. We would wonder if he's in jail. And the wow. worst part, we would wonder if he is dead. Mm. But now it was like, okay, he's over here. Okay, I'll go and have a cup of coffee with you today. One of the biggest things that helped us the most yeah. was to create communication. Mm -hmm. And because I was loving toward Jack and I had his best interest at heart, right. which by the way, his best interest is what he likes in his mind, right? Yeah. He doesn't want to get off the drugs. So in right. his mind, he, he told me already when he came to my house, remember originally I said he didn't care if you committed crime, he wanted to go to jail, all of that stuff. Right. 
he changed his mind after about four months or five months of being with me Mm -hmm. because he said, I'm not afraid of jail. And I said to him, well, I didn't say you were afraid of jail, but is that the kind of life you want to live for the rest of your life? You want to eat peanut butter and jelly every morning Mm -hmm. for the rest of your life? Is that really quality? Right. And all of a sudden it hit him and he was like, oh my gosh, you're right. This is so dumb. And guess what? That spreads like wildfire. He yeah. went out on the streets and he told his friends and his friends were like, you know what? You're right. Like, why are we being so stupid? Like, why do we not care? We yeah. are more valuable than that. And then after about a year or two, he was like, I don't want to commit crime anymore. This is ridiculous. I want it. One of my biggest things that I want to make my uh, priority is no more crime, no more jail. But remember, love is patient. Love is kind. It took a year. It took two years. And throughout that time, what was holding me in a wonderful, joyful place was the love that I was sharing with him that I was receiving from the source. Right. That is God. I was getting that from God, from Jesus, and I was spreading that to him. And the reason that's also important to know is because in the past, I did try to show love to people. But then what would happen is it was my own human love. It was not supernatural. Yeah. And it would run out and I would get dry and I would get, I would get sick. I could not recover. Yeah. Um, and be able to continue to help. I would just be like, okay, I I can't anymore. I can't. And then I would go in the place of fear and frustration and, and not being patient, not being kind, which is everything Jesus does not want. Yeah. So the source of that love that I received was through Jesus Christ. And I would ensure that I would go to that source and I would go to the places where there was many believers in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was, those were the places where I could feel that love energy that would just enter into my heart more and just make you make you, I don't know, for me, it feels like I'm going to burst from love. That's how (laughs) how much love it is. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, every love combined on earth with divine love. And he just wants to shower that on everyone. He wants to shower that on everyone. And he's just waiting. He's waiting for people to come to him so that he can bestow that love upon them and show them his fullness of his goodness Mm -hmm. that he can give to them. And so that was my experience. And it continues to be my experience with Jack. After about another year, he said that I don't want to live on the streets anymore because originally he was like, I don't care. I want to go live on the streets. Leave me alone. Yeah. Then after many lunches, many coffees, many fun times, many fun stories because we kept in touch with a phone. Yeah. I was saying communication is key. If you can afford to get your loved one a phone, that is the key. For them to be able to communicate with you. Yeah. And mind you, the world was even telling me that that would mean that you are enabling him. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and it's like, uh, how is giving, like in my mind as a pharmacist, giving a phone to somebody to be able to communicate with you is not enabling them. Right. And with the new psychologists that I found, that agreed with this kind of mentality and walked me through that. Yeah. I found that they were very careful with the word enabling. Mm -hmm. They would not just openly overuse it on everything. I had a parent actually ask me if it was enabling for them to get chalk, to give chocolate to their loved one. (laughs) I mean, that is like, that is the degree that, the lie has gone out into is right. to me enabling can be very subjective yeah very subjective for instance let's say someone is shooting up drugs right mm-hmm. 
and you go and you're like, stop shooting up drugs. Let me get you uh, paraphernalia so that you can breathe it and inhale it as a pharmacist. I know shooting goes systemic, a lot more side effects, right? Yeah. Now that one, is it enabling or is it helping them to slowly come off? Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And helping them in the place where they want to be helped. Right. Now that same scenario, let's take it and redo it. Someone right. has never used drugs. You go and you give them paraphernalia and say, here you go, start. Mm -hmm. Now, is that enabling or not enabling? See right. how using it can be? Yeah. And what happened with Jesus is that he just took all of that jargon out. His approach was just love. Mm -hmm. Forget all of this extra stuff. We all only have a limited amount of time in our lives. Yeah. And he says in the Bible, my burden is light. Mm -hmm. And he really means it. Yeah. Kind of just removed all of that. Okay, is it enabling? Is it disabling? Is it? It was more, what does he want in this moment in his life? How can I assist him get what he wants without harming him and having him die? Right. That was, you know, a yeah. lot easier. And, and at the same time, things that I can do. Right. Things that make me joyful, things right. that make me happy. And that's how I started to treat him. And the rest was between him and God. Mm -hmm. If he's choosing to continue doing that, then that's between him and God. Mm -hmm. and, but that brought me and the rest of the entire family into a very joyful place. Yeah. We've got tons of memories. We've got holidays that we celebrate we've got coffee times we've got lunches mm -hmm. uh, and guess what he has started helping us actually now so it's <laughs> like then slowly after all of that i said to him look why don't we build you a place to stay and you just stay in this place in this back house yeah and after me going and talking to him and praying for him and blessing the area he finally agreed to it Oh, good. Once we made that place, then afterwards he was like, this is the best thing you've done for me. And I was like, are you serious? Now you're happy? Like before you were not. And, and then now he stays there. Mm -hmm. That has given us a lot of peace of mind. Right. Who he is. And in the beginning, let me tell you, he would still venture off sometimes. Right. But what I did is I came in and I said, I understand that it can be overwhelming here in this space. If you ever feel that you want to just get away and you want to be with your friends, just let me know and I'll put you up in a hotel. Right. Again, because I could afford it. Right. Now, let's say I couldn't afford it. Let's say you are a person that cannot afford the hotel. Right. Another scenario. Okay. You want to venture off? That's great. Just keep your phone on, please. Like, just let me know. So I can buy you a lunch or I can buy you a dinner. Yeah. I can send you some pizza wherever mm -hmm. you want. I had a yeah. parent, one of those, um, uh, psych one of the psychologists that did that for years. Would yeah. Just send her son pizza. And that would allow her to know where he's at and give her a peace of mind that he's right. alive, get to know who they're with, uh, have a loving relationship. The only way that you can be able to do this is through love. Yes. A loving relationship. Yes. And not putting force on, on that person and saying, you have to be like this, that I yes. am saying. Exactly. If you say that, then when you call, they're not going to answer your call. Exactly. So that's what I just want to make sure that the people understand and realize. I think that's an amazing story. You, you've wowed me to death because <laughs> you really, you know, you go against the AA principles and the principles that have been here for decades and you just showed us a new light. You just showed us a new way of approaching addiction 
you know, and a beneficial way because it, you know, you're, you and, and Jack are examples that it works and go into the higher source using God as a, po a power, not giving Amen. up, but looking at things in, in the, in the light of things and looking at love instead of, of, of hate and anger, you know, really giving it to, to the God and, and, and connecting with your higher source and being able to really put things together in a way that a lot of people don't. Now, if you had to wrap that up, like if you had to, you know, if people came to you, you know, my loved one is suffering from addiction or I'm going through addiction, what would be some steps? Because sometimes, you know, when you go through these things, especially with addiction, you're lost, you need help, you need guidance, you know, like, which way do I go? Where do I begin? You know, and some people, they they want help. Some people, you know, they're just, they just don't, they, they don't even realize they, they're not happy. They know they have a problem, but they don't know how to begin. So, you know, if you had to like sum it up and give some takeaways, like ways to begin a recovery process, you know, and, and, and also maybe talk a little about the caretaker, the person helping that person, what advice would you give? So what I would say is for the caretaker, they have to make sure that they are taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. You can really get lost in taking care of a person who has substance use disorder. Yeah. So you have to make sure that in that process, you are also doing things that make you feel peaceful, mm -hmm. that make you feel taken care of. You have to make sure that you do that. Yeah. And for me, what that meant is being with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I felt he spoke for people to know, come sup with me. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is what I felt he spoke for today's podcast. Come sup with me, which means to come have dinner with him. And mm -hmm. I will take you into the light. And so if for me, the way I found peace, because this was a, I have ways that I can find peace. I turn on a candle. I watch a nice television show. Those things gave me a little bit of rest. Yeah. But the main thing that refueled me and refilled me mm -hmm. was staying with the Lord Jesus Christ, keeping my eyes on him. Yes. Doing listening prayers in the morning. That's what worked for me. And that's what worked for Jack. Because the entire time that I was doing this, the still small voice in my mind that did, he did not say for him to go to a treatment facility. I have, I have to say, I'm sorry, but because he doesn't want to go to a treatment facility, Jack yeah. is refusing that as will many. Okay. Yeah. And what I felt he spoke is for me to pray for Jack to be infiltrated with God's Holy spirit. Mm-hmm because I'm not sure how much you or the viewers know about Jesus, but in the Bible, it states that there is God, the father, mm -hmm. there is God, the son, and there is God, the Holy spirit. Right. And in the Bible, it states that if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and savior, and you wholeheartedly believed that he died and then he became alive again, and repent for your sins, which means to ask for forgiveness and to change your mind and decide you're going to be with God mm -hmm. and to step away from what it is that you are doing. He will send God, the Holy Spirit into you. And that is what was giving me the source, the source of love mm -hmm. that I would then go and share with Jack, right. the continual source that I could not have by watching like a television show or um, watching uh, or, or turning on a candle, those would give me temporary peace. Right. Now, if you are not someone who is in Christ yet right now in your life and you want help, I would say Jesus loves everyone and approach the situation with love, with love. That is the main thing that I did. 
I thought about it and I said, okay, what is the loving thing to do here? That is not going to make Jack angry. Mm -hmm. That is going to allow him and I to continue to have an amazing and wonderful relationship together. Right. And then that is the place where I went from. And Jack did the same. Yeah. Jack also recognized that. And over time, he started noticing that Adina is different. Adina is not forcing me. Right. Adina is a source where I can go to for help. Right. And he shared with me so many times, thank you for taking me out of this darkness. Yeah. Where he felt he had to lie to everyone. He was all by himself. Right. He had to get and lie to all of his loved ones commit additional sins right. of lying in order for him to continue the habit that he could not stop right. and have a desire to stop. Why? Because that is a coping mechanism that he's used to by this time. Yeah. And so that's going to take a lot of time and that is in God's hands. Mm -hmm. I understood that I cannot heal Jack. Right. All I can do is be his loving relative and show him kindness and bring right. him and encourage him to go get treatment. Right. And whenever he would say, Oh, I want it. I would be on top of it. And I'd be like, okay, let's go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did take him. I took him to doctors, um, but I waited for the right opportunity. Right. So the advice I would give to people would be to love your loved one wherever they're at in their journey. Right. Doesn't matter where they're at in their journey. Love them exactly where they are at. Yeah. And have no judgment, just plain loving coffee, plain loving fun, whatever it is that you right. guys do. Do that. Mm -hmm. that is what brought Jack back. Not a bunch of lecturing. I did. Trust me. I was the queen of lecturing. <laughs> Sometimes I still do it, <laughs> but that did not, that does not help Jack. And that did not help anyone that I know in my life. Right. It was helping that I saw helping was a love connection where they're at. Yeah. And for them to come to that realization that, wow, this person loves me so much. Right. I must be worth something. Yeah. <laughs> Let me treat myself as someone valuable. Right. And then want to change on their own. I love it. I love <laughs> it. I really do. Now you provide services. I want to know a little about those services. Can you tell everybody about them? So what I do is I, um, on my website, I know it says that I do need to change that to say mm -hmm. that I can do speaking engagements. Excellent. So I will come and I will do speaking engagements. And as time goes on along with that, there might be other fun events that will mm -hmm. be happening during the speaking engagements or Wonderful. I pray that those times will bring a moment where people can reconnect. Yes where the, these loved ones that have just been like on the streets away from each other can yeah. reconnect and share love during those times. Right. That's exactly. the main thing that I am doing right now is uh, speaking on multiple platforms mm -hmm. and providing speaking engagements. I also mm -hmm. have a nonprofit, which did stem out of Jesus Christ. That mm -hmm. is part of my uh, purpose and mission on earth. Yeah. It's called Changing Lives Through Love. Mm -hmm. And through that nonprofit, we go out on the streets and we give a pamphlet about mine and um, Jack's journey mm -hmm. to people who are homeless, along with items that Jack feels they really need, which are things like hand warmers, yeah. socks, um, beanies to keep them warm, an right. emergency blanket so that they do not freeze and so they can be okay first aid kit so if they have any kind of injury or anything they can have something there to treat themselves right jack feels that those are the things that will help on the street because 
since there's a lot of people there that are misusing drugs, what happens is that if you give them like an item that will last a very long time, then what they will do is they will just trade that in. Right. Like go and sell it for a drug. And so he feels that it's important for us to constantly give them items that are uh, necessities right. that are going to take care of them in those moments of yeah. the free cold. And there's also going to be a snack bar in there so that they can have. Oh, that's, that's amazing. changing lives through love, doing that mm -hmm. for them and encouraging them to reconnect with their loved ones. Um, and that is what I do right now. That's so amazing. <laughs> Thank now, you. Where can people contact you? Where, sh where, where should they go to contact you? Um, there is my website, www.dradinapharmacist.com. Okay. And there is also the shorter version. They can put dradina.com. It's D-R-A-D-E-N-A.com or D-R-A-D-E-N-A-P-H-A-R-M-A-C-I-S-T.com. And we'll put all of that in the description. So anyone who is interested in contacting Dr. Adina, they can go into the description and they'll have the, the links to contact her and to speak with her about the services she provides and the speaking engagements. And this has been amazing. Is there anything else that you'd like to share before you go? Um, I just want to share with you that before I was understanding the love of God for all of humanity, I was in a very different place. I was in a place of fear. I was in a place of worry. And um, I was in a place of sadness. Yeah. After I felt the love of Jesus Christ and for the entire humanity, I came to a place of light. Mm -hmm. I came to a place of love. I came to a place of joy and hope. And I discovered that I was not alone. And I realized now that the only reason that I wasn't really able to see all of those other things is because that was not my main focus. Jesus was not my main focus. My main focus was my work yeah. and my life. And as many of us are like that, we have to make a living and we go, we work and we don't realize what's really out there and all of the resources that God has provided for us on earth, both right. for the who believe in him, he provides resources. And for those who don't right. believe, he provides resources. He is just waiting for us to find him, seek yes. him, find him so that he can bestow more of his fullness and resources to us. Right. <laughs> this has been amazing. Thank you so much for all this information. You know, you're a true inspiration. You know, I think you you really helped open up eyes to a lot of listeners. You know, uh, addiction and caretaking is two very important issues that need to be tapped in. One, when you have when you when you're suffering from addiction, there are so many people out there that have an addiction and they just don't know where to go to get help. They don't know how to get help. They relapse. They're going through emotional issues that they just don't know how to cope with. And then you have people who try to help them and some succeed, some don't. And it's important to have people like you who give guidance and give suggestions and show people other ways, other tools, other techniques, other, other, you know, words of inspiration to help people and to help addicts, you know, in their lives that they care about. And even to help people, you know, that aren't, you know, you could, just to be a volunteer and just to go out there and to help others, you know, the way that you're doing it is is not uh, a common way, but it works. And it's great to have an, a different option because, you know, society, sometimes we, 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 we have, you know, regular traditional ways of handling things. And sometimes those traditional ways just don't work. Everybody is different. Everybody, you know, handles things different and dependent on the addiction, dependent on the person, dependent on what's going on in that person's life. Everybody is different. And you don't want to get to a person before it's too late because so many lives are lost because of addiction. So we really want to do whatever we can to help people with addictions. And it's people like you who really take the initiative and really, you know, help others make a change. You're, you're doing something really vital to help our community. And I thank you for that because it's, it's people like you who really 
help others get a second chance of life and love. And, you know, and, and not many people, you know, always get that. So thank you so much for being on the show. And thank you for all this great advice. You provided so much great advice today. And I'm so appreciative that you came on the show. And hopefully we'll see you soon again. Thank you. And I just want to remind uh, people that this is not medical advice. It is only for informational purposes and that you should all seek your own healthcare professionals for medical advice, your own physicians. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Stacey. Thank uh, you. You're so welcome. You have a great day. Thanks. You too. And God bless you all. <laughs>